Hey, welcome to the uh, Aramir Roundtable. Today is the 4th of December, 2020. So welcome everyone and uh, have uh, Wayne uh, as a guest. He's uh, started a fairly new service with Aramir uh, end of September, a sleep well portfolio. And we're here today to talk a little bit about it. So uh, welcome back, Wayne. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm excited. We're, uh, we're kind of talking about a, uh, a subject that it's, it's kind of under the under the tidal waves sometimes. So um, I appreciate you having me, and it's always exciting to be here and uh, and talk to the Aramir community. We've got a, a just some amazing members here. So oh, uh, fantastic! Yeah. Getting into things, let's just first start off with uh, the disclosure. And uh, just wanted to say that Aramir or myself or sleep well investing is not an investment advisor or broker dealer. Um, all our webinars are for educational purposes only, and that options, futures, currencies, and trading all involve risks that are not suitable for all investors and to make your own decisions when investing and trading your own money. Past performance is not indicative of future results, and everything on this uh, web, or everything on this slide deck is hypothetical and is meant for education purposes only. Did I miss anything, Tom? Nope, looks good. All right, um, just a little brief nomer. I know uh, uh, Tom did a great job introducing me. Um, my name is Wayne Klump. I run the Sleep Well portfolio here at Aramir. Uh, it's more of a, uh, like a long-term approach with uh, that's a dynamically shifting allocation models to reduce macroeconomic risks. But we're going to kind of talk about more on um, something that applies to pretty much everyone and not necessarily just investing or long terms or the sleep well portfolio. It can literally blanket to everyone. So um, does anyone remember uh, Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner? <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. so <laughs> I, I pulled up this picture because it always cracks me up. I always loved Coyote. And if we kind of look at this picture, can anyone say that what Wiley Coyote is doing is going to work? <laughs> like he might be miscalculating a few variables, like the fact that that bow and arrow probably weighs less than he does. <laughs> so it, he's probably not going to go anywhere <laughs> and he's probably going to get hurt in this situation. Now, uh, you know, whereas the Roadrunner is kind of using just tried and true methodologies of just running on pavement, right? You know, <laughs> so it's a, uh, it's something to kind of, I always love kind of thinking about this because as I, as I'm investing or as I'm trading or as I'm learning something new, I'm constantly asking a question of, okay, what am I not seeing? Right. What's a variable that is possible that I'm not paying attention to. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk about something that has been brought up to me many times. And I don't think that I, I wish that I would have learned it earlier in my career and really understood it and grasped it earlier in my career. And so um, the presentation today and, and almost all of the presentations that, that I put on here at Aramir are really just kind of sharing the information that I wish I would have known coming in uh, into trading and investing and in the finance world. So um, today, this topic, I, I, I've heard it from many people, uh, from strategy developers, risk managers, traders, subscribers, even investors. There's a common thread here. And that common situation is, uh, you know, everyone using positive expectancy systems, right? You know, positive expectancy is drilled into traders, right? We all kind of understand positive expectancy. And if you don't understand positive expectancy, you will soon. Um, and then, you know, everyone's, you know, disciplined and they're being accurate to some sort of trade system or they've got a system their own and everything's going great. And they all have this desire for account growth, right? And this desire for account growth um, is kind of where things start to get a little bit shaky. And then sometimes this ends up leading to subpar or negative returns on their account. And the whole thing is, is that if we are, if we are getting this section correct, how is it that when we have a desire for account growth, that it leads to uh, 
subpar or negative results. Like what's going on here? And so this is a little variable that can kind of be undertone, kind of like Wiley Coyote and the bow and arrow that we talked about earlier. So the common variable between all of them, which there's a common, uh, so we've got the position size fluctuation. So a lot of the time when we're trying to uh, grow an account, we're either adding capital, we're taking away capital, we're doing it in a behavior sense, we're doing it in it, it, all sorts of different reasons that we can position size fluctuate. Maybe it's a statistical thing like, hey, I'm, um, I've taken some losses, I wanna add some more capital, things like that, all sorts of different things. Um, that lead to position size fluctuation, but that's definitely a common variable when I see the setup that we talked about on the previous slide. Also, uh, sometimes there's just leverage involved, right? Leverage is inherent in options, uh, leverage in futures, leverage in the system itself. Um, we'll talk about kind of different ways to leverage here in just a little while. And then um, all kind of relate to volatility, um, position size, leads to different volatility and leverage leads to different volatility. And so really what we're talking about today is this magic little guy down here is volatility, but not necessarily volatility in the sense that we all remember it, uh, or, or we all uh, most of the time um, looked at it or, or have defined it. Volatility means so many different things in the options world, right? You've got implied volatility, you've got volatility of the underlying, you've got at the money volatility, you've got volatility in the strategy, you've got, um, you know, it's so what I'm talking about in this sense um, is more of the volatility in our strategy and our account. And that's what we're going to kind of dig into. So we've got um, the three basic premises behind growing an account, right? I've really simplified all this. So um, someone that wants to dig into details and things like that, there are other variables, but I'm just saying these are the three basic building blocks to building an account is making sure that we have good probability, right? So our number of winners versus our number of losers is higher on this side and lower on this side. So we want good probabilities as much as possible. And that is in relation to risk reward. So we want to make sure that per trade, we have a strong risk reward. So basically our winners are bigger than our losers. And by doing that, we can afford either less probability or more, or we need more probability to keep our expectancy high. And so that's that's the basic nuts and bolts of expectancy, but we'll get into that a little bit later. A quote unquote investor, right? And that's an investor is just a trader over a different time frame. Typically, that's kind of how I view it, right? Um, so an investor looks at risk reward uh, slightly differently, or even a portfolio engineer looks at it differently. We typically look at the standard deviation of an equity curve to determine our risk, right? We sit there and say, okay, um, this asset moves like this, you know, and say our SD is equal to say like a 12%. So we can expect a 12% and then say, hey, we've got an annualized uh, of something like 9%. So by that, we can see that our reward to risk nine over 12. So there you go. So there's there's our reward risk, right? So it's just a different way of looking at it, but it's looking at it through an equity curve sense, right? And you can use standard deviation. We can use Certinos. We can use downside deviations. There's lots of different calculations out there. Um, and there's no one like perfect way to calculate, uh, you know, risk is risk. And I measure risk and I measure volatilities and I measure things differently than probably the guy next to me. The main point is, is for sure the make sure that we are doing a calculation that is correlated to our trade performance and is optimizing the risk that we need to take and it's accurate for the risk that we take in the future right so let's kind of look at just a general two setups so we're just looking at two different trade setups here um, and we're going to kind of aim a little bit more towards the uh, quote unquote options income trader, because um, I know that that's a lot more common here at Aramir. Um, but we can kind of change some of these numbers around and, and it can still 
be the same universal approach, right? I, I can use the same universal approach when I'm engineering a portfolio and I can use the same universal approach when I'm looking at day trade setups. So um, it's just the math, the, as long as the math is still um, utilized in the same way. So on a per trade basis, we've got a roughly 60% win ratio. And then um, most day traders will look at like a three or like a five to one uh, reward to risk. Um, right today, we're just going to look at a one to one because this is a little bit more indicative of what an options trader for like, the, like an income trader will look for is that if we're at a 60% win rate, we'll get more like a one to one, um, a lot more um, a lot more equal on our average. And something I want to say here is this is an average reward to risk. And by saying an average reward to risk, I really want to point out that it's like, okay, just because we have a maximum risk of say, you know, 10,000 on a $50,000 account and say we've got, um, $10,000 max gain, right? So that's a one-to-one, -one, but those are like hard numbers that we've put in the sand of like, that's our max risk. What I'm more looking at is, okay, average over time, or you can even look at the mode, right? But the average over time, hey, what is my average win versus my average loss? And it's more closely probably to one-to-one -one, uh, if we really look into it on a 60% win rate. And then um, we've also got over here, so on this side, we've got a higher probability with a quote unquote lower average volatility. And this is something that can be really deceiving here is, um, and I know some people kind of felt this in like 2018, right? Is that we've got an 80% win rate, which means that we typically get a win almost every month or, you know, uh, you know, maybe two times out of the year, we don't get a win or something like that. Um, but what happens is, is that if we look at the average reward to risk, we get something closer to like a one to three and how that actually shows up is, you know, we can get like a, uh, you know, a $200 win, $200 win, $200 win. And then all of a sudden we take like a $600 loss. Right. And then we get like a $200 win, $200 loss. And then, you know, hundred win, hundred win, hundred win. And then we take like a $400 loss or something like that. So it's just a little bit spikier where we're getting this like steady whack and then steady whack and then steady and then ah just a little bit and then just a little bit and then whack right so then our average win loss um yes we have higher probabilities but we're taking these tail risks right and there's lots of different strategies that you know try to take care of this tail risk but what we're going to get into is more of um not necessarily how to eliminate those tail risks but how their volatility relationships can affect to an account growth so let's kind of just look at a table here. And by the way, I have graphs. So if, if, you're, not a, uh, if you're not a table person and you like to stare at a bunch of numbers, um, I'm gonna throw a graph up here because I kind of think the same way. Like I would like to look at things uh, visually, but we're gonna go through this. So here is a typical setup where a trader would say, okay, here we've got 60% um, uh, probability and a one-to-one -one re uh, reward to risk, just like we talked about earlier. And we've got the same trade size going down and down and down. And we can see that as we traverse, we make money. So everything is all happy. And by the way, check this out. We're making 80% over 20 trades, right? You know, that's that's a fantastic trade, right? You know, oh yeah, you know, let's, let's do that. Um, so this is a really common setup, right? And then let's look over here on the 80% and a one to three. We got a 40% win as we traverse down this, right? 20 trades all the way through. And by the way, this is still that one to three. So you notice here it's 500, 500, 500, 500, and then whack, you know, we get this big whack. And, uh, you know, sometimes people feel that and sometimes they don't, you know, it depends on how we risk manage and how accurate we are to our, our um, our strategy. Um, so let you know graphically, what does this kind of look like? Um, here we go. Just as something nice and clean. You can see here, we have an overall positive drift on both of these overall positive drift on both of these. So everything's going up, we've got trade size going or we've got a um, 
accounts growing over time. Now, the point that I said earlier, which is where we start to get into a little bit of trouble is, okay, well, say, say I, I started this trade with like a minimum size, right? You know, I started it with like, I don't know, 5,000 or, you know, 100,000. It depends on, you know, how much you want to trade. But let's just take like the smallest humanly amount, right? 5,000, right? Because when we scale from 5,000 to like 10,000, right? We double the size of our trade and it really drastically changes our trade performance, especially in the short term. So when we're looking at, okay, I want to increase my trade size. Well, on this sheet, what I showed here is that we gained 40% and we gained 80%. But if you notice here, we held a static trade size. We never changed trade size ever. So forever, we have this quote unquote income trade, but at the same time, we can never ever scale up the account, right? So what if we do want to scale up the account? Well, let's take a look at that. All right, so this is a situation where I compounded the returns. So I've still got a 60% one-to-one, -one, nothing's changed, 80% one-to-three. And what we did is we said, okay, we started out at $10,000, but now every win that we have, we add into our next trade, right? And then we have a trade outcome of a loss, no bueno, and we take that and we start that as our next trade. So as we keep going down the, down the time frame here, down to the end, we can see that we have grown the account. So fantastic, right? We could compound this trade and still make 87%. In fact, we make, we're making more on a compounded annual growth rate, right? Well, let's look at the 80 to one to three. It's pretty much the same thing. We're growing 63%. So that's still more than what we were talking about. So compounding, this is working fantastic, right? Okay, well, we're still doing a 500, everything like that. Nothing's changed. Um, let's look at this graphically. Um, it's slightly different because I changed where the numbers were, but it's still basically the same premise. But now with compounding, you can see that we've got a little bit of a steeper growth and yet again, a steeper growth, right? On both of them. And we've got positive drift. That's all good, right? That's growing an account. Okay, so I'm really going long-witted here. What the heck am I talking about? And where am I going to get to the point? All right, so let's dig into this a little bit more. What if, what if we want to sit here and say, okay, we've got a 60% win ratio with a one-to-one -one reward to risk, and we've got these trades. And what if I were to increase the volatility of these trades, right? We're going to go from a average of a 20 and an average of 10, and we're going to crank it up, right? Now we're going to talk about how it gets cranked up in a lot of different ways, right? But what we're looking at is we're going to crank up our, our average volatility, right? So that yeah, means what it, we're going to- Hey, it looks like there's a little math error on the, the right column. The, the mm. first one, 10,000 at 500, and then the count value uh, <laughs> goes up 5,000 5, nice. instead of 500. <laughs> nice. I added a digit there. I, my, my bad. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, from here moving forward, it goes forward. So it was just. Yeah, it looked like just that first cell was wrong. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for someone checking my math. I always appreciate that. So, um, yeah, the, the cell is going down. We're still having a, a growth. And so that would explain uh, why we've got that little cell. But the point is, is actually the math going down from here. And we're still showing that from a 15,000 right here that we're growing all the way up, right? So everything's yeah. all fantastic and happy. Um, so ways that we can increase volatility, right? Well, we can allow our wins and losses to increase. Okay, well, if we allow our wins and losses to increase, what, wh why are we allowing our wins and losses to increase? Well, maybe we take a large loss, right? Or maybe we're at a loss and we can't, uh, we, we don't, we don't want to take that loss. And so we're holding on to it a little bit longer. And, you know, we've all heard the stories of traders, you know, running into that and it's really common. Um, and then, well, okay, well, then the next trade, we've got to hold on to our winner, right? We've got to really, really crank this baby up so that we can make up for that loss that we had, right? There's lots of different like psychological reasons that we hold on to our wins and losses. 
especially if we don't have a really defined structure for our trading system, um, maybe even like swing trading, right? You know, how long are we going to hold on to the market going up? Um, so that's one way, right? Uh, another one is we increase our position size per the account size that we have. So um, say for instance, so uh, if we have a $100,000 account, then we're trading with $20,000 of it, like, okay, fantastic. That's all great. Um, then we want to, maybe we want more return than what we're getting off of that 20%. And so we crank it up to say 50% of the account, right? Well, now that 50% of the account is taking on risk. And if we're still adding in our wins and losses from the total account, the volatility of the trade is um, increased respective to the account size. So that's another way that we can increase volatility. Then another way that we can increase volatility is something that's a little bit more, you know, mischievous, right? You know, and it's really undertone and it's that the market or the trade system status quo shift. Right. And, and I talked about this yesterday and I'm glad that it's drummed up a lot of conversation. And, you know, I, I, I definitely contradicted some like research that's out there already, um, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, but what it, uh, what it comes down to is that there are environmental shifts in the market that can change our our trade parameters even on something like i used an example yesterday with like a, a broken wing butterfly the um let's take the same situation and we'll erase that and if we still look here so we've got 10 going down just ignore my first error here there's just a, a problem so if we go through here and we cruise down here you can see that we actually lose by changing the volatility from what we had said earlier to 50 percent so we didn't change the expectancy we're still a 60 percent and we're still a one-to-one -one. all we changed is that each trade loses 50%, which is huge. I mean, this is a massive volatility, but I'm just trying to show a point here. So I'm not saying that, you know, hey, yeah, I trade, you know, and I lose half of my money every trade and, you know, I'm going to take this on my entire account. We're just trying to look at um, the concept here, right? So we lose 60%, we lose 40%, right? Let's look at what that looks like on a graph uh, percents, right? Well, if we look at a graph, this is kind of how this goes. And I know this is crazy, right? And um, so typically we get this nice compounding, we're growing, we're growing, everything's going great. We have no losses, but now we're at our largest trade size up here, right? And we take this massive loss, right? Because we're on this one, we're a three to one, right? And we take this big massive loss down here and then we're going along, we're going along, and then we still take another one of those big losses. Well, what's happening is, is that because we're having to compound this or we're, we're growing this per our account size and the volatility of the trade, it's actually causing us to take huge losses compared to what our wins are, right? And I, and I felt this, I know many people have felt this, and this is kind of a phenomenon of account, right? And we're gonna kind of dig into why this is in just a second, but I'm just proving here we go, this is the same situation with a, uh, the, the lower probability one, but the higher risk reward, it's still having the same effect, albeit it's not as clean and simple as our uh, three to one, but this uh, one to one is still losing money. And I really wanna add here that I didn't change the probabilities. You know, we're still, we're still where it's at. And even on top of that, I, you know, I'm, it's, it's just all I'm, all I did here, right. Um, from this point all the way down is it's still a six to uh, a 60% probability and a one-to-one, -one, right. And as we keep pushing this forward, it's still going to do the same thing, right. It's not going to change. All right. Well, what kind of happens with behavioral position sizing? So I just kind of wanted to overlay this in that we've got a, uh, the same situation in orange on a three to one, we're compounding, we're compounding, we're compounding, we're doing fun, we're, we're having fun, we're doing great, we're doing great. And then bam, we take this big loss. And then we're like, you know what, we're going to trade size down, and we're going to move our account size down. 
And then once we trade size account down, right, and we kind of maybe skip this trade or something like that, then all of a sudden we're taking hits. And then wait, things are going good again, right? Let's start compounding these returns and let's start sizing up, sizing up, sizing up, sizing up. And then all of a sudden the same thing happens, right? The probabilities come back into favor and you take loss and everything goes there. And we basically just lead to the same thing where we're taking a loss over time. Same thing happens with our six to one, uh, or uh, sorry, our 60%. Now that we go through this, everything's all fine and dandy, but then we take this loss right here and we say, hey, you know what? We're gonna trade size down, maybe skip a trade. And then we go through this whole deal and it all happens all over again. And we just keep on taking money out of the trade and take losses until eventually our account just dwindles and we stop trading that system, right? We go, oh, the system did it to me or, or whatever. I've made all sorts of excuses for why this happened when I first started. So, it, it, you know, whatever the reason, um, we'll get into that, but um, you know, psychologically, this is just behavioral position sizing, right? I studied, um, I studied behavior in college. And what's fun about behavior is that if we, if we reinforce a behavior that we want and punish a behavior that we don't want, um, we can get organisms to do all sorts of crazy things. You know, we can get pigeons to squawk and turn left and turn right and do all sorts of crazy things for a flashing light bulb and, um, and what ends up happening is, is, uh, all through this time period, which let me just erase some of this here. Um, this is just position, uh, behavioral position sizing, right? Um, so all through the beginning of this time period, we're feeling good, right? We're, we're adding capital in because what's reinforcing us is Every time we add capital, we add capital, we add capital, we add capital, we're making more money. We're being, we're being rewarded, you know? We're being rewarded and reinforced for doing that until all of a sudden we get whacked, right? And so this is just behavioral conditioning, right? And then we get whacked, right? And then something happens, right? One of two things, right? But one thing is like, we go, okay, well, we trade size down out of self-preservation, right? We go, oh crap, you know? So we got punished for the very first time and behaviorally, we've got to sit there and say, hey, we've got to try to protect ourselves. So, you know, we go into the fetal position or something like that and um, we decrease our trade size, right? But then we start getting reinforced again and we go through the whole cycle over again, right? And it's just a, it's, it's just, it's a very natural momentum um, through behavioral conditioning. We see this in the market too, right? As markets get overheated, all of a sudden they get a big hit and then no one's willing to go long on the market at the bottoms. Um, or maybe even worse, we've been behaviorally conditioned to go long at, at bottoms, right? Because that's been working for us over the last 10 years. And then all of a sudden the bottom really drops out, right? And then we're losing all of the money that we risked, right? And then maybe we can even take a situation where, oh, look, it bounced back though. This is awesome, right? Fantastic. Well, then what happens the next time that we buy at the bottom and it doesn't bounce back and it stays down there for 10 years or so and we get another lost decade or something like that. You know, um, behavioral conditioning is really apparent in the market. Well, so what we're gonna talk about though is not necessarily behavioral conditioning, even though that's a really fun topic for me. Um, we're going to kind of dig into, okay, what happened, what happened from our situation where we took a 10% and a 20% average volatility and we cranked them up and we didn't even change the expectancy, right? I mean, everyone's always drilled expectancy, expectancy. What's our trade expectancy? Um, well, this little hidden variable in here, which is volatility is really affecting the account growth over time if we're compounding. I really want to label here. This is if we're compounding or as if we're trying to increase our trade size, right? So what ends up happening is, is something that I know someone's heard from me because I'm a huge proponent of it, but it's Kelly criterion, right? So what ends up happening is, is here, let me just, um, let me just kind of point out what the equation is. And I'm not going to really like, Hey, you know, this is not going to be a math class for sure. Um, obviously I'm not trying to drill math in by, you know, my small error on the other, on the other slide, I'm just trying to uh, show a concept here. Right. Um, so we've got our probability of our wins 
right? And then we've got our probability of our losses and then we've got our win to loss relationship. And by that, we'll get our expectancy. And this is a pretty uh, drilled in concept for anyone that's been trading for a little while. And if you uh, haven't been trading and trading for a little while, um, start looking at expectancy of trading systems and it'll help you out. So anyway, so um, what we're trying to figure out is we're trying to figure out what's our Kelly criterion fraction of our capital bet. So a little history on Kelly criterion is it was a, um, so a guy named Edward Thorpe kind of uh, used it. There's lots of guys that, that have used Kelly criterion. Um, even Warren Buffett has been said to use Kelly criterion. And what it is, is um, this guy ended up discovering uh, through mathematical principles, if he could figure out what his win was going to be and what his loss was going to be through like a standard bet at like blackjack or, um, or a horse race. And then he could figure out what his probabilities were. He could figure out what's the maximum amount of betting that I can do per my account size to maximize the growth of my entire account versus the risk of ruin. And so all it's, I'm, I'm gonna show kind of a graphical representation of this here in just a minute, but let's look at what our two trades Kelly criterions were. So if we just look at expectancy here, a 60 and a one to one, we get a 0.2. If we get an 80 and a one to three, we get a 0.2 roughly the same Kelly criterion. Now there can be some decimals in here and stuff like that, but I'm just saying like here, if we just use these raw things, we get roughly a 0.2. So, okay, um, what does 0.2 tell us, right? Well, Kelly criterion says that I can only bet 20% of my account. Does that mean that I can only bet 20% of this trade? Well, maybe, maybe not, you know? Let's kind of dig into that just a second. Um, in the eighty, in the eighty percent, does it mean that we can only bet twenty percent? Because that's what Kelly Criterion says. It's what's the fraction of capital to bet, right? Well, we're going to use Kelly Criterion in a slightly different way when it applies to an option or of a fractional bet size or a strategy per se. So we're going to kind of use it as a maximum area of leading to blow up risk. And so this is kind of a graphical representation of what Kelly criterion is saying. It's saying, hey, as we increase our volatility, right, the volatility of our account, right, we get higher returns. But what happens is, is mathematically, the bet size ends up leveling out at one point, which is about where one Kelly is. That's our maximum bet size per, but you can notice that it starts to round off well before bet size. So a lot of people actually run on a half Kelly. Uh, but then once we increase over the bet size, we actually start to slow down our account growth, right? And then if we look at maybe even another representation is once we actually get over one Kelly, um, we can actually go all the way into making our trade lose or making our, our account lose over time. And this is that kind of hidden principle that I was talking about. And this is what happened to our, um, to our trades, right? We had these two winning, we had these two winning, uh, winning trades that we compounded and everything was all fantastic, right? And we took a 20% vol average to a 10% vol and then we cranked it up. So what happened here is instead of using bet size from Kelly, we can derive actually that Kelly was saying, hey, if you're running this expectancy, we cannot handle anything more than an average of 20% on our vol, just an average of vol, 20%. So once we hit this 50 marker, we started blowing up. Once we hit an average vol of 30, we started blowing up, right? we start having a decreased effect on our positions or on our, uh, uh, on our account. And it's because we started getting into suicidal risk over here. Right. <laughs> so I always love that little graph because I always think back at it and that's exactly what we get. We just get this dropping 
account value. We get this dropping account value, right? And that's because we've increased our volatility per the amount and we've surpassed what our Kelly has said. So all we, it's a very simple run is we can just calculate our Kelly criterion per our expectancy and we can see, okay, what's the maximum amount of Kelly that we can handle? Well, something that is um, a little bit more of the undertone, like, okay, well, these are all really controllable, right? Okay, well, I won't increase my position size. Oh, I won't grow my account or I, I won't, um, I won't do these certain things, right? Uh, you know, I won't, uh, um, I've got really good behavioral conditioning where I don't increase my position size as um, I get more wins, right? And maybe I do it the opposite way. So, you know, maybe we're that kind of a person, right? Um, well, can, um, one of the points that I made earlier, which was, can the market change our volatility of our strategy? Well, you know, something that I talked about yesterday, and which has drummed up a lot of great conversation, is that, you know, if we look at a butterfly in 2015 um, versus 2018, so this is 2018 right here. And uh, if we look at a butterfly in 2015, right? If we look at both of these, you know, they look relatively normal, right? You know, nothing different. You know, they're great. They're still the same size. I'm. I'm flashing back and forth between these, right? Just to kind of say, okay, you know, to the average eye or, or to the naked eye, these two look very similar, right? Um, they're both the same width, they're in the same volatility, uh, which I'll kind of, so we can see here. Um, so we're pretty close to the same volatility, right? Uh, nothing crazy, we're like, you know, a 12.88 average on, on there and then you know, we're pretty close. We're here at, you know, about 11 or so. Um, so relatively the same average volatility. Okay, well, here we go. Here's a graph res representation so that it's like nothing crazy. We've had a little bit of a rise and we're on a down day. Okay, we've had a little bit of a rise and we're on a down day. So these, uh, this is just as best as I can kind of grab that would look like two, um, two volatilities that would kind of match each other, right? We're coming off of a little bit of a higher volatility. We're coming off of a little bit of higher volatility and we're coming down. So this is, this is as best as I could do to try to grab two markets that were on the traditional sense, the same environment, right? Relatively the same implied volatility, relatively the same in, uh, uh, market movement, things like that. But let's kind of look at, did the trade look the same? really like not looking at the naked eye. Okay, if we grab two average days in 2015, right? So an average day going over this direction and an average day going over this direction, right? We're roughly at about maybe a 5% loss over here, maybe a 4% loss, and we're doing pretty solid over here, right? So an average day of the downside, this is perfectly fine. Well, let's look at what two average range days stacked together looked like in 2018, even though the trade looked the same. Drastically different, drastically different. So it's not that we changed the position size, we didn't do anything like that, but by putting on the same trade in the same way we've done for years and everything has all been fine, we're drastically seeing a massive change in the amount of volatility a trade is taking versus two average days strung together, right? I mean, this is taking a 12% loss down here in 2018 versus, you know, a little miniature 4% loss, right? You know, so we're talking three times the amount of volatility in our trade on a two-day basis. That's a huge volatility jump. And we didn't do anything with our position size. What's happening is, is our, our account, or not our account, but our trade itself is increasing its volatility, right? So if we've got a trade that grows over time based on a certain probability and a, a certain expectancy, and all of a sudden we're creating a lot more volatility in it, our account's going to, if it, if it breaches over the Kelly criterion, we're going to start being extremely inefficient and possibly even losing money over time. So I kind of overlaid these two just to kind of really 
drive drive this is this is basically the same trade here and you know same position or same uh spread size and everything like that and the presentation i did yesterday what i did is i changed this to where we uh, would see uh, a larger um so if you haven't seen it you know you can go look at that one but anyways what ends up happening is you can see here i mean we're taking huge huge amounts of risk far more in 2018 than we did in 2015 and that's for different reasons and skew and environment and all sorts of things and that's what's been the great about the topics that we have because even pointing this out now it's starting to drum up thoughts of okay well why did this happen and you know how can we make sure that we're measuring the right thing moving forward and um that's awesome i look really i look forward to hearing all about that so um but yeah can a single trade change its general volatility? Absolutely, it can, right? We don't even have to do anything. The market can do it for us. The market can change the volatility of our trade, right? So, you know, what's the ultimate solution here? What, what, what do we do here? Well, something that, you know, I think everyone always drills home, and I'm not saying that this is the only solution here, but one ultimate solution is to make sure that we have uncorrelated uncorrelated trades and we're rebalancing across them, right? We have something different, right? Um, that acts different and fundamentally different. So what I did here is I took that 60 to one uh, win loss relationship and I just kept adding that 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 probability and that one to one. And, and anyways, eventually we ended up leaving down that we are losing money over time, right? But if I take the same data and I offset them. So you can kind of see every green arrow here is offset just a little bit. And this is just a perfect example, right? In the real world, we don't get perfect correlations, but um, we can rebalance them across on every single trade. And even though we're taking these massive losses, right? Um, these 50% losses and stuff like that, we can actually grow the account in an exponential fashion through compounding growth, right? Instead of losing it just by having three trades. I mean, I, I didn't change anything here. I'm not change, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a trade better, right? I'm not trying to say, hey, that trade um, that loses, if I run it over time, I can't compound it, right? But I can compound it if I can add other trades with it because every trade that we add one to every trade that we add reduces the amount of volatility, which is basically just the fluctuation of the account, right? it reduces that amount of volatility and increases the amount of, or the probability of return over a given time period because we're off balancing each other. And so by doing that, we can still uh, grow an account in an exponential manner. And so we can get our cake and eat it too, right? We don't have to leverage up. We don't have to um, do crazy things and add more capital to a certain trading system or anything like that instead of focusing on one trading system. We can get a few trading systems. And then if one starts to die off, we're still paying attention to it, right? Hey, my volatility in this one has started to increase, but that's okay because I'm balancing off of something else. And if I deem that it's going to be a loser forever, right? And the environment is gone forever, we can just phase it out and it's no big deal to the account, right? So as a recap, just to kind of dig through everything, constant position size doesn't exponentially grow, right? And something to note is that when uh, a, a drawdown happens, when we're using a constant position size, and I'm going to use an extreme example here, but let's say we've got $100,000, right? And everything's all fantastic, right? But then let's say we draw down 50%. Let me put zero in there. So say we draw down 50%. Well, if we draw down 50%, then we're down to $50,000. Well, what if the trade, what if our position size that we were originally trading, what if we're like, well, I can only handle $50,000 on this $100,000 account. Well, if I'm at $50,000 and I draw down 50%, I'm actually trading my entire account now. So just by sheer losses, we can increase our position size if we're using a static constant position size going forward, which forces us to make, um, which, which forces us to increase our risk during losses, which as long as the trade system is okay, that's great because it makes the account bounce back faster, right? Um, but in a compounding situation or something where um, we're looking at a position size allocations, we can't do that. So when compounding a position size, 
pending the trade volatility, we can't scale. If the trade volatility or the equities volatility is too high, we can't scale it 100%. We've got to scale it back. We've got to decrease the volatility either through position sizing um, or through other means to decrease the volatility so that we can scale it. Um, adding in profits can increase risk and cause behavioral position sizing losses. And then definitely, definitely measure expectancy versus our downside volatility for every trading system and also the history of our personal trades to determine our long-term position size. So, you know, if I've got a trading system that I've been using and it's got a 60% probability and a one-to-one -one reward to risk, that's all fantastic. But then when I look at my own personal trading, I'm more at like a 55% probability and a one to 1.2%, right? If that's the case, then I need to adjust my position size accordingly, or hey, maybe the expectancy of when I trade this isn't actually functioning well. So maybe I need to figure out what's going on. Is it slippage? Is it environment? Is it the time of day? Is it um, psychological? Is it mistrades? You know, we can dig into all sorts of different things, but um, always look at the expectancy of the system and the ex uh, expectancy of our personal trading. Um, Know when a position is taking more risk versus history. So exactly like what we talked about in 2018 versus 2015, are we taking on more risk versus all variables held constant, right? Um, the amount of volatility that I'm selling versus buying, the amount of skew that I'm buying versus what I'm selling. Um, am I taking on more risk, right? Am I it's just on an average true range day? If I just look at an average day, am I still taking the same risk per the gamma that I'm supposed to take, right? Um, and, you know, and definitely watch out with like Delta, right? Delta doesn't scale with the size of an asset, right? Um, you know, a 10 Delta on the SPY is uh, vastly different from a 10 Delta on the NDX, right? You know, one is massive risk and one is like nothing. So, um, and then final, you know, diversify and, and rebalance based on our downside volatility or our expectancy and make sure that we have multiple assets that are balancing out our risks so that we can grow the account in a compound fashion. All right. Well, it was great talking to everyone and I'm sure we'll go through some questions and stuff like that, but you know, I just want you to know that I wish that your assets grow and you sleep well and everything's fantastic. Uh, so let's see. I, I heard some pop or I saw some pop through, so I'm sure we're going to get into some craziness, huh? <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Rich asked, can you go back two slides ago, the upside down parabola? That was um, about 14 upside minutes ago. Upside down parabola. I can scroll back. I'm sure maybe he's oh, talking that, about that, this. That's probably that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what about it? Um, just to kind of look at it, I guess. That's all. Yeah, that's all. He just wanted to see it. Okay. Yeah, this is um, what this is just basically saying. This K down here is um, a single Kelly. So if Kelly comes out and say your your Kelly equals uh, 0.2. So if your volatility has surpassed uh, an average of 20, right, uh, then you're starting to reach over onto the other side of here, right? And then if you're, um, and this drop off, I like this graph better than um, the other graph that I showed because this graph kind of shows a little bit more representative because what happens is as we increase our account size beyond a Kelly, we really increase the risk of ruin. And this drop off is pretty dramatic, right? Um, because, uh, because the ability for us to take a loss probabilistically um, becomes shortened and we can take that excess volatility off and, and start creating a loss in the account where we just basically say, hey, we're not trading anymore. So. Oh, uh, Rich said no. It was a uh, one more slide back. Uh, it's probably this one. Oh, probably that one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yes, he says. All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, there you go. So that's that's basically saying um, the same thing. So just to kind of reiterate, this is um, as we approach the apex of uh, a Kelly criterion, we're still growing the volatility of the account exponentially, and so. Um, as the Kelly breaches, uh, our effect of the growth of the account is diminished and we're still taking on excess volatility in an exponential fashion, which creates a higher risk of ruin.
Okay, and uh, Andrew asks, where did you talk yesterday? That was in the beginner and small account trading group. Yes. Um, oh, and Rich says, um, okay, so that is account volatility, not market volatility. Right. Yeah, volatility, that's one thing that, you know, volatility is, yeah, it, there's so many different ways to use the word volatility, volatility in the underlying, volatility in the option, implied volatility, volatility across term structures. You know, it's so much that volatility is, but yes, that is the, and in other words, that is account fluctuation, right? So let's, we can just like, if this helps, cross this out. And this is account fluctuation. Okay. So that's your account equity fluctuating. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Which is the same thing. It's sigma, it's uh, standard deviation. It's, you know, however you want to measure your account fluctuation or volatility, it's, that's, that's what that is. No, it's interesting. Um, I've got a trade simulator um, as one of the tools, and um, I, it's always very instructional to uh, to use it to, to show how a trading system can be turned into something that's kind of all over the place to a steady growth by basically uh, having a basket. So uh, it's um, it shows, for instance, if you do like one single price stream. It'll show, you know, okay, we made money, we lost money, and it just goes up and down. But if you do, say, like 30 or 50 of the same trade in different accounts, essentially, mm -hmm. it shows the maximum return, the minimum return, and the average return. And the average return is almost, depends on how many um, assets you use, but it's almost always essentially a straight line. Yeah, and there you go. Yeah, I mean, you add enough. I mean, it, there is a diminishing returns, but yeah, I mean, if you if you add enough uncorrelated assets, I mean, you're- It's the whole Ray Dalio it. idea, right? Yep, that's exactly the point. I mean, we use it in the sleep well, right? We Now, we also take into account fundamental relationships uh, in the sleep well system, but um, yeah, it's the same concept is that we can outperform a single equity stream, say something like the SPY, and um, and we can do it with less risk um, while still retaining a lot of the, the growth and we can take out uh, a lot of the losses just by adding more assets. The only catch is, is that in the real world, right? Um, when we're kind of digging into assets, um, in order to match the return of um, a single asset. So let's say it's the highest performing asset in a portfolio. So this is where um, we all kind of get into trouble a little bit is say I've got something that returns, you know, 12% on average a year. Well, if I add an uncorrelated asset to it, that's fantastic. But what if that uncorrelated asset only returns like 4%? Now I'm giving up return for reduced risk, right? And so that's not a great situation, you know? And then if I add another one, so every asset that I add that's less than 10% typically will draw down the, the it's performance. It's a drag on the performance, yeah. Right. Now, it's not always because I know someone's probably going to correct me here. Um, it's not always because if you do get something that is inversely correlated or really, really uncorrelated, basically, you can add it to the account and it can actually lift the returns. Um, of course, if you're like a truly inversely correlated, then it's not going to be a winner, right? You know, we're going we're gonna to be putting in a, a losing strategy on top of a winning strategy, um, which has its merits too, but that's a different story. All right, um, and again for the uh, um, the beginner and small account trading group meeting, I still have to edit that. There was a, I guess, a little um, thing I need to take out of the recording before I post yeah. it, so I have to do that today. So that'll be in the library probably later today or tomorrow at the latest. But tomorrow's my anniversary, so I might not oh. be able to do too much work tomorrow. So. <laughs> well, you know, congratulations on the anniversary, and you know, keep the marriages going for long times is a lot of work in itself just like trading right <laughs> yeah um my, my mom had really good advice uh don't marry for the looks because the looks go and um you know marry your best friend <laughs> there you go yeah don't you know i i swear I, I you know as i got into investing and everything like that i i kind of frame everything back into investing so it's like hey you know, don't trade a system just because it's hot right now. Trade a system because you can keep it up forever, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, um, 
you know, it's something that works well in the life and our, and our personality, but, um, yeah. So, uh, were there any other questions? Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, I, I just, I do want to point out for people who haven't seen the performance of the sleep. Well, it's, uh, it's on a tear. Um, we started on the 29th of September and, uh, this looks like this week's already up almost 2%. So the total, you're up almost 20% since the end of September, which is, uh, I guess, pretty stellar. I mean, stocks are hitting new highs and you're positioned correctly for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd love to take all the credit for it, but, you know, I mean, there's, you know, the markets are doing good. The assets that we were in and where the risk was is really kind of paid off. And, um, you know, we, we haven't been in some of the alternatives that we normally can be in that portfolio. Um, and those have been on a super drag. So we've literally had like a kind of a little bit of a perfect world, um, which happens every now and then. And it, and it's done really well for us. Uh, the, um, it, you know, and just like we were talking about with like marriage earlier, right. You know, um, jump into a trading system. That's all fantastic and everything like that. But um, make sure that we're jumping into it because it's something that works, you know, for us long term. And we know, okay, you know, as this thing does well and as this thing doesn't do well, and we like um, kind of what the fundamental approach is to it and things like that. And always make, you know, always make your own decisions for sure um, um, and research. We did have one more question from Lloyd. Uh, what are the general methods to measure account volatility? Oh, um, so... Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thanks, Lloyd. Um, so uh, downside deviation. So, so some people just look at standard deviation, right? You know, um, they just, uh, and by calculating standard deviation, that's all fantastic. The only problem with calculating standard deviation is, is and here I'm just going to kind of sketch on this, is like, let's say we've got a, um, an account that just loves this. I'm just literally scribbling on here. We can kind of look at this and see that these big fluctuations happen to the upside, right? But our downside fluctuations are relatively smaller, right? So what we do is if we measure the SD, we're gonna, we're gonna measure what its general fluctuation is over a base, over an average, right? You know, that's, we're basically gonna say, hey, how far does it go this way versus how far does it go this way, right? And we're gonna say, okay, our general uh, standard deviation is, you know, just whatever it's um, or it's, you know, it's a uh, 20%, right? And that's one way, right? And like I said, there's many other ways to calculate things. Like, you know, there's ways to calculate volatility. There's ways to calculate skew. There's ways to calculate. Um, it's just whatever way is really correlated to how we want to feel risk. So for instance, if we want to feel the least amount of fluctuation in an asset, right? And an equity curve, then this is a great way because it is, it's going to reduce overall fluctuation. Another way is to only measure downside standard deviation, right? Which is uh, one of my preferred methods. And so now we're kind of taking all of these guys out of the mix, right? Now we're only looking at, um, here we go. Let's just, uh, this to the screen. Yeah. so now we're only gonna say, okay, what's our standard deviation to the downside? What's our standard deviation to the downside? And that might be on a situation like this, that might equal like maybe 10%, right? And so our downside risk is 10% and we're not taking off the returns. So something that this is, um, this is really common in the financial industry is we look at um, sharp ratio and that's a, like a highlighted spot. Let me just go down here. So sharp ratio, sharp ratio, kind of looks at the average return versus the SD, right? And then the other one is a Sortino. And I prefer a Sortino because what it does is it looks at the downside volatility versus its uh, growth rate, you know? And so that's a little bit better in, in my, in how I view risk, right? You know, it might not be right for everyone because that isn't going to diminish the volatility in the overall account. It's just gonna diminish the loss volatilities. Right. So that's one way for an asset. Um, another way to measure volatility through like options, right, is we can look at what gamma is. Um, and definitely not gamma in like a sense of, hey, what's the gamma? I'm at like a two, right? 
um, yeah, that's all fantastic and everything. What's the gamma per, uh, what's the gamma per implied volatility or what's the gamma per ATR, right? So if we look at gamma, um, and this is like a whole nother subject. So if I'm going too long here, you just stop me. Okay, Tom. So, right. um, so if we look at gamma, it's, you know, say we're taking, you know, two, you know, we're just going to say we're $2 per point, right? Per one point. Um, well, that's all fantastic, but is that the same risk um, in a, something that we're at um, a 1,000, say we're at a $1,000 asset, right? Well, if we take that same gamma of two point and we have an asset of, um, let's say something like 10, right? <laughs> if our asset is 10 and we move one point, that's a 10% move and we're taking a $2 risk, right? You know, that's a very different thing than if we take, you know, a one point move in a thousand I mean, that thing doesn't even phase that. Like, that's barely any move, right? So that's a, that's a big difference, right? So the, the, the Greek can kind of, um, the Greek can kind of hide this relationship. But if we take gamma and we say, okay, here's gamma. My G is terrible right there. Um, by the way, I'm writing with a mouse. So of course this is all, you know, I'm, I'll get a pen maybe one day. But um, so if we take gamma and we put that over um, an ATR, let's just say ATR, because ATR scales really nicely. So if we put a gamma over ATR and we're saying, hey, we're at um, a two, right? Now we can take that same gamma and change it to a different asset and it's gonna normalize its ATR. And so since we're normalizing on a denominator, we can, um, we can look at, okay, this is what our gamma risk is. And we can say, okay, we're taking the same amount of risk. And so, um, now we can say, okay, now volatility to volatility, apples to apples. Now we're measuring volatility on a trade the same. So if we were to take a uh, gamma per ATR on the NDX versus gamma per ATR on the SPY uh, or on the SPX, we'd start seeing um, how much risk are we taking per the volatility of the ATR. So hopefully that kind of answers that up. There's lots of different ways to measure volatility though. Um, and those are just a few examples. Oh, let's see. If Faye has asked, in which ETFs are you now and what percent? I guess that's kind of the secret sauce there, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it changes every well, week. Yeah, I can, you know, it, it's, um, you know, that's, that is the, the, the subscription service is meant to be a, the Sleepwell subscription service is meant to be a very simple, easy to follow ETF portfolio that, theoretically is very uncorrelated to say someone's like options trading or something like that. I've been using it like that for a long time where when my options go out of favor, say something like 2018 or certain times of this year, even when, um, when I can, I can tell that spreads are really out of favor. Um, I can use the sleep well as, as a, uh, as a base to rebalance from, and I can just chunk my money in there type of thing. And so it's meant to be something easy that once a week we just uh, change our allocations and it kind of uh, it follows fundamental relationships and uh, nor, uh, reduces macroeconomic risk. So um, lately, lately we have been very concentrated in um, the different types of equities, which are large caps, small caps and emerging markets. And uh, we have started to see some other um, assets uh, pick up their relationships, which means that we're really kind of on the cusp of maybe switching into more defensive modes and things like that. Um, but we'll kind of have to see um, each each week comes up with new calculations and it's always refreshing itself and it's always staying to what currently the risks are in each asset. And so that way it's not curve fitted uh, based on some sort of historical data. And uh, I, I did post the Sleepwell performance page that's uh, updated in um, almost real time every 20 minutes or so. And uh, there was a question if that was uh, using leverage to hit 20%. And uh, no, that's unleveraged. So yeah. pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty great performance. And then uh, Greg asked, if you trade a Sleepwell in a cash account, have you done any analysis on the tax consequences? And uh, what about wash rules? Uh, yeah, wash. I mean, you know, wash rules do apply sometimes. You know, that's a 30-day turnover, 
Um, um, I use it in retirement accounts and non-taxables and it was designed for a non-taxable. Um, but um, I mean, it, it can, and I have used it in a taxable account. You know, I, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, well, um, I'm not trading right now in my taxable account because, you know, things are so unfavored or, you know, I don't have time or I've been busy for a few months and I might as well throw it some sleep well because the probability is I'm going to make some sort of money. So then I'll, uh, I'd rather pay taxes on something than nothing. That's my, kind of my methodology. That doesn't mean that it's the right methodology and it's right for everyone, but that's just mine. Um, but yeah, there, um, there is some, uh, some tax consequences if um, you're not kind of being savvy with things because we are purchasing and selling ETFs and sometimes they're held for less than 30 days. Sometimes they're held longer for 30 days. And most of the time, I can almost guarantee it, almost guarantee that uh, we will trade in and out of a, an, an entire asset within a year. So we don't necessarily get the long-term gains uh, benefit. Now, if you're a little bit savvy, and um, I know there's, there's some subscribers that use options. Um, and yes, I've, I've done that as well. You can use options on the broad-based indices. So like uh, we have SPY and IWM in the portfolio. And so we can use SPX and, um, and the Russell options to kind of get the same delta if you normalize. And that will give us a 60-40 rule at least um, so some tax savings as far as that goes. And then um, Greg asks, could you toggle between 2X and 1X ETF? I don't see why not. Oh, so yeah. So, okay. So this is, this is where we're trying to grow an account, right? You know, this is exactly what this presentation was talking about is we're increasing our volatility of our, of our account during different times. And we can do that in a behavioral sense, or we can do it in a statistical sense. Um, Something that does work really well um, that I've played with and I have done it, but I haven't done it in like a systemic way. So I can't really speak to experience on this to just be honest. Um, is that um, when the when the sleep well has been underperforming for a little while is to leverage up. Right. Um, and and, you know, it'll it'll bounce the account back and then leverage down when it's overperforming type of thing. Um, that is something that a lot of uh, traders do, even with like a, a, a systemic trade or a, um, a trade system. Um, I know like uh, if you're familiar with like John Locke, I think John Locke talks about that too, where if um, if he's got a trade that's lost, you know, three times or something like that, he'll increase the trade size to it, things like that. That's a really common approach in trading. Um, as long as there's not a fundamental shift in the... Um, trade system. So, um, of course, the sleep well is pretty solid about not using curve fitting and not using past data to determine what its results are going to be in the future. Um, but something like um, something like like a butterfly structure, if we were using the same probabilities in 2015 versus 2018, they'd be pretty drastically different. And there was an edge erosion in 2018. And so, if we were trying to do the same methodology of, hey, let me leverage up or let me scale up as this trade's taking on losses, then in theory, it makes sense that that would make an account grow faster unless there's a fundamental breakdown in the actual, um, in the actual trade system. So I would say for me, I would want to make sure that I know all the, I know as many variables as possible. Of course, know that most of the time I'm wrong and say, okay, can I sit here and look at this and, and am I okay with increasing my trade size, knowing everything that I know? And if I'm wrong, what am I risking type of thing? And yeah, then I could increase leverage. And then Jim asked, uh, can the sleep all page also show allocation for the leveraged ETS? The, I think he's talking about the performance. Uh, what I'm gonna have to do for that is um, record the uh, leveraged ETFs um, the prices on like Tuesday mornings and then uh, calculate the shares and all that stuff. So there's a bit of programming and database stuff to do to, to get that uh, to show up. Um, um, it's it's going to be uh, obviously more, um, you know, bigger returns and bigger losses, but right. the equity growth will still be pretty solid, I think. 
Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I, I leverage up uh, the sleep well in some, in some of my accounts and um, you know, it's, it's definitely had a good time over the last few months. I bet. Yeah. So, um, but at the same time, I also know the risk that I'm taking with it and, and yeah, I mean, it definitely, you know, there's, there's always something to say about uh, looking at the trade performance of the sleep well and, and saying, heck yeah, I want to leverage the crap out of this thing. Cause it's amazing. Um, which I'm not saying is a, is a good or a bad decision because everyone's got their own risk tolerances. Um, cause, uh, I've done, I've done that in the past where as we increase the, the amount of assets that we have in a portfolio, even though they decrease the, the returns, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, Tom, um, if you just leverage it up now you're actually getting more returns versus the amount of risk because we're borrowing cash right and so we can go negative cash to increase our um our returns and actually surpass the the efficient frontier and that's a whole nother math concept that actually i posted a, a video about that exact concept on the forums that was an mit course and he's going to explain math a lot better than me because he's an MIT professor. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what you could do even is uh, create your own version of a uh, kind of a blended uh, leverage and non-leveraged uh, sleep. Well, you know, I have like X percent of my portfolio non-leveraged, another percent leveraged, it's, you know, 1X, 2X, 3X. Because they, they will uncorrelate, actually. You're, you're exactly right because they will uncorrelate and it will naturally force if you rebalance between if if we were to rebalance between those two right a leveraged version and an unleveraged version um it'll it'll kind of naturally without some sort of you know um behavioral bias it'll naturally force us to put more money in the leveraged version when it's drawn down right so it would uh, it, it would definitely in theory um uh, net more returns by using its own probabilities against itself. That's a brilliant idea. Um, one more question from Andrew. How can you protect from an overnight gap? Um, like a, you know, like we had earlier this year, big moves down. Um, are, 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 uh, well, you know, I, I definitely don't play to be an expert in anything. Um, so I'm sure there's lots of ideas for how to protect the, uh, downside risk and in, in many different portfolios um in like a long only exposure like uh you know like what i've got in like the sleep well and stuff like that i don't i don't protect the downside on those um there are some times where the markets ran up really hard and volatility's dropped out and we've gotten a ridiculous overextension and i use that setup that has um, positive expectancy to maybe like a put buying strategy that naturally protects the downside on my account, but that's a totally different strategy, right? I'm not trying to look for um, a protection against my account. I'm looking for a strategy that uses a situation that is a weakness for a, another strategy that I run, but has positive expectancy on its own. And then by pairing both of those together, it naturally takes care of um, what you're asking about, which is downside risk uh, for overnight gaps. So I, you know, I look for a strategy that says, okay, when do we have the most overnight gaps, right? Um, say like in the situation that you talked about, which is where the market ran up, um, we had uh, uh, a correlated volatility relationship to the SPY and um, you know, really ridiculously low volatility in certain areas of the SKU or something like that. And I can purchase, say, you know, debit spreads or something like that, or bearish call spreads, or, you know, however you want to kind of play it. Um, there's lots of different ways and you'll just buy raw puts or something like that. Um, and that can be a, a really favorable strategy if it's position sized and if you, we can get enough, um, iterations of it to show what its expectancy is over the long run. And then now we're putting a positive expectancy strategy on its own to hedge our, our other strategy. And now I can combine those two and we can get best of both worlds. And to me, just a part of the protection from the gap risk is the uh, diversification of the portfolio. I mean, you look at how much the market went down earlier in the year, like 35% and the mm. sleep well was down seven or eight. 
Yeah. And then we ended up making money right after that because the bond pushes and things like that. I mean, you know, there was fundamental relationships in there, but yeah, you're, you're hundred percent right. Like, um, can we protect over like a one night gap or something? I mean, we're still in an allocation, so no, I mean, we're going to have that, but what's the largest one night gap we've seen. Okay. Can we take that risk going forward that maybe we're going to see that again? We do have, um, limits on the market nowadays. Right. And then also if we have like a, like a 20 VIX, right? You know, what's the largest one night gap we've seen in a 20 VIX or what's the, I mean, even still the sleep well portfolio allocates and shifts allocations every week. So really what we'd be more focused on is, Hey, what's the largest down week we've seen. Right. Um, and let's say in a worst case scenario, we're in a hundred percent in one asset, right? Like, let's say we're just a hundred percent in gold, right? what's the largest one week move we've seen in gold, right? Um, and something like that would actually uh, tell us a little bit more of what the risk is, right? And so the higher cross asset volatility we get, the more risk we're taking um, when we concentrate, but at the same time, we're taking less fundamental risk and less statistical risk based on uh, risk parameters that I use to measure. So there's a balance between, okay, how much risk do we want to have versus with diversification versus is diversification costing me because everything that I'm going to diversify into has an extremely high probability of losing right now. So no, I don't want to diversify. I want to concentrate. And so that play of diversification versus concentration, kind of what Tom, you were saying, which is um, diversification can reduce risks as well. Um, that's, that's really a, um, the golden goose of some uh, some aspects of the sleep well and just of just portfolio engineering in general. All right, I think we've uh, covered all the questions. I uh, went a little bit longer than normal, but uh, that's a good reason to go over and people are engaged and asking uh, about it. So great presentation. Uh, really, uh, thanks for, for coming on and uh, going over the Kelly criterion and uh, diversification portfolio theory a bit and um, yeah. Great, great job so far on the service and um, very, very happy subscribers so far. Yeah, well, you know, I appreciate everyone that has, uh, that is, that is, you know, have found value in it and has actually brought back uh, value in other sense. Like they've, you know, some people have made uh, adjustments to the service and they've done something that's different and has worked really great for them and everything. It's really a great community and, um, you know, just, uh, everyone that participates is just phenomenal in many ways. Yeah, that was a, a little bit of an, a surprise of how some people use it, where um, they still have their own option trades or whatever else they're doing, but they see how your allocations are shifting, maybe in or out of equities, and they use that to adjust their downside exposure. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, a, that was a unique approach, and I thought that was brilliant. I'm actually going to do some more research on that to, to see if the sleep well is an indicator in itself. And, and clearly um, a few of the subscribers have already pulled the, the data for it and has sat there and said, Hey, you know, I'm going to start using this as a timing model also. Um, even though that's not what the sleep well is attempting to do is time the market. It's just, um, uh, so that's really a awesome thing. Yeah. All right, Wayne. Uh, thanks again. Uh, have a great weekend and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thanks everyone.